Hello everybody, I'm live. How are you there? Nice to see you again. Um, well, I'll give you a wee second, I think. Maybe can somebody let me know if you can hear me okay? And uh, I'll see if a few people here already. This is it. We're getting better at using this technology. Um, so some, if you can't hear me, I do like a wee bit of confirmation. Someone get, yeah, loud and clear. Thank you very much, Grimdark Elven Warmaster. Nice to see you again, by the way. Um, thanks very much for joining us tonight, folks. I hope you're all keeping well. Um, it's a bit of a stormy night here. Um, but there we go. That was our episode on uh, the evolution of the axolotl tank, really, and, and the technology that produced Golas and ultimately artificial melange. And, and I suppose is also behind the, the group, one of the big mysteries in June, which is where are the Trilaxu females? So um, I quite enjoyed watching that episode again. It it's, uh, refreshes, refreshes my memory a wee bit, I suppose. Um, so I'm very happy to take your questions on anything at all to do with tonight's episode or the Tlanaxu or June, June Universe, June movies or anything science fiction. So uh, if you have got anything for me, fire away, folks, and let me, I'll, I'll have a go as usual. Um, but uh, yeah, the, just, and I'll just babble a wee bit while you're, if you've got any questions and you're tipper tappering away. Um, but uh, I think the whole, the whole thing with, with, it's quite interesting within the, June universe is that the idea of hydraulic despotism. Uh, Sean says, "Hey, have a client meeting in half an hour, but we'll hang around while I can." Thank you very much, Sean. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, you know, so yes, the the, the hydraulic despotism idea. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of that in society at the minute here, even um, uh, particularly with I suppose uh, the gas prices at the minute. Um, it's quite interesting because the, even at my dad's estate, they're laying they're laying a lot of new gas pipes and stuff, and they don't use gas. But the, the prices went up about thirty five percent just before they started laying. Um, so yeah, the, the idea that the axolotl tanks, I think that they one of the interesting things that, about them, I suppose we all associate them with the goals, is that they ultimately end up producing artificial melange, um, which creates a a new form of hydraulic despotism in the June universe. And uh, as we, we were sort of, it's mentioned there in the video that the Tylaxi, whenever they create the Duncan Idaho, the, the Duncan Idaho Golas for um, the Bene Gesserit, that they take um, hard payment in Melange only, even though they know that uh, there's virtually, you know, the, the Bene Gesserit deposits are running low and uh, that they can produce as much Melange as they like with their axolotl tanks. Um, I don't know what you think about this, but um, it, it sort of begets, we, we kind of understand, I hope you all understand what axolotl tanks are, and it is basically are the uh, are the Benny Trilax women. Um, so not not only do you have their, um, I suppose they're described a wee bit as mules, aren't they? I was at the face dancers, but um, their society is all male, and um, well, it's, it's obviously, sorry, it's not all male, obviously, because they do have women, um, yeah, they've they've kind of almost they've imprisoned their entire female population and turned them into reproductive tanks that can be used to sort of reproduce new people from corpses and um, you know and, and embed person well embed skills and then ultimately personalities. Um, but then at some point we understand that they're using these tanks to make melange artificial melange, which is a which is a drug. Um, so the, the, the Frank Herbert's continual cyclic spirals of behavior um, work in so many different ways throughout the universe, and and particularly this is this is where we see this working with evolution, and you know uh, human evolution playing off technological evolution, playing off human evolution within the universe on a broader scale, but we get to kind of look at it in, in microcosm with how it, how it sort of affects the. The Tlaxu society, I suppose, and we only kind of get a glimpse of that, a bigger glimpse of that in the later books, you know. So, um, and yeah, again, the, the the need to produce a drug like artificial melange, I think, is quite interesting, um, because what what I don't know if if you're going to produce artificial melange, uh, whatever it's melange's properties, surely you would try to take out the, um, it's fatal if you withdraw from it, part of it, if you see what I mean, you would maybe try to alter that. Um, and the big with, the big the big thing about melange, I suppose, that would put you off is, is that if you can't get your hands on it and you do go into withdrawal, then it's fatal. 
And um, I think it's a very interesting drug in terms of science fiction. Oh, so it's one of my, my dogs again. Hello, Molly. Do you want to? Uh, excuse me one second, folks. I need to let this dog out this door. Come on, love. There you go. You go this way. Yeah. Here you go. Take your time. That's it. <laughs> Oops. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Sorry about that, folks. Um, I kind of do brought this is sort of the dog's house as well as as my wee kind of office. Apologies. Has anyone got any questions on um on anything? Far away, um, about tonight's videos or um, you know, these issues in June or um, science fiction in general. Far away because it's it's much more interesting when we get a good interaction with you guys. I think. So um, let's see what you have to say about anything tonight. Uh, has anybody got a question? Or will I just keep babbling? <laughs> Um, I'll tell you what, I'll talk a wee bit about melange, I suppose. There, there's a couple of drugs in science fiction that are like melange. Um, and the, the main one is Vril from, from Edward Bulwer Lighton's um, uh, Vril, The Coming Race. Um, we talked a bit about it in the section that we, we built up to this, giving you the kind of layer to Victorian literature and its and the response in particular to the debate you know between Darwinian evolution and Lamarckian evolution that was going on at the time. Um, but those two books, Erewhon, uh, where we get our, everything about but Butler and his Butlerian jihad from, and the other book is Vril, uh, and I say this to a lesser extent, Vril: The Coming Race, because the main thing that Vril contributes to June is is the drug, and um, if you, if you look at the properties of Vril. And the properties of melange, they're almost identical. Um, and we have a real world product that exists because of Edward Bulwer Lighton's um, book, which is called Bovril. <laughs> so it's from the Latin word for beef and vril. And of course, um, in, 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 um, in vril, the coming race, the drug vril, it's, it's kind of also to do with a, a Lamar and it's to do with a Lamarckian evolutionary trait. Um, but the, the, it's a kind of energy, it's a drug, it's a fuel, it's a weapon, um, it's all of these things. Um, in the same way that uh, melange works in a, 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 in a range of different ways. And there's another drug in, and I can't remember the director's name, but there's a rather good film called Southland Tales. Um, Goodness gracious, that's going back a few years. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of a sort of an adaption of a few different Philip K. Dick things. It's, it's very good. I really enjoyed it. Um, and the drug in it is called Fluid Karma. And um, again, Fluid Karma would have um, some of the similar properties, I think, to, to Melange. Uh, those three drugs kind of have a commonality. Babs is there. Hello, Babs. Nice to see you. Um, Babs has got a question. Isn't it that the honoured matter is rage against the telexia related to their treatment of women in tanks? Uh, could, uh, again, Bob's going back a wee bit, can't remember exactly, but uh, I, w I wouldn't see why not. <laughs> I wouldn't see that such a thing wouldn't drive any kind of woman into a rage. Um, but um, I think the point is with the honoured matter is that they can't control their temper. And um, I suppose that's it, that, that, that they represent that other side of the Bene Gesser that's kind of that is wild and feral uh, to a degree. And I think I think we talked about you know what kind of people would you need coming out of the scattering. Somebody asked the question the other night that, that would be ready for this Kralizek thing. Um, I think somebody had suggested that you know with, with the, the Bene Gesserit were a civilizing factor or something in that in that process. But I think I had suggested that um, basically um, you would need savage people. To, you know that that the, the, the idea of what the God Emperor does with the the Golden Path would be to create savage people. Um, so there we go, I think. Uh, Sean says, since Frank Herbert straddles the old rockets and ray guns and new introspective science fiction of P PKD, Philip K. Dick at all, he seems to be the only one that looks at the societal consequences of drugs rather than the individual. Stephen Campbell says, good evening, Doc. Hi, Stevie, if that's you. Uh, if that's the real, is that the real Stevie Campbell? The Daily D? Let me know if it is, Stevie. If it is, hello and nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, Frank Herbert Strabble's The Old Rockets and Raygons and New Introspective Science Fiction. You know, seems to be the only one that looks at the societal consequences of drugs rather than the individual. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, I don't, I don't know about that, Sean. I, I, I would have to have a good think about that, but I can think of a lot of science fiction 
drug books, um, if you if you know what I mean, or books that drug feature drugs and their their consequences on society. So certainly Philip K. Dick does a lot of that. A lot of his drugs are kind of um, for people who are like in the colonies. If you know what I mean, in space, they're to deal they're to deal with loneliness or that kind of thing and altering their their reality. Um, frequently mentioned. But I would, I would have a think about that. As I said to you, um, Sean, I've been thinking, of, I, one of the things I was doing is going to do is a look at um, uh, drugs in science fiction. <coughs> um, but he, I would, I would, he certainly does look at the societal consequences of drugs, but you, you, it, it's, it's hinted at a lot, isn't it? You, you ha kind of have to have a think about it. If I withdrew from Melange, what would happen to me? Crap, I'm dead. <laughs> um, so it's... It, 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 the, there's a lot just sort of suggested from that, you know. I frequently mentioned an important text in the June series of the Orange Catholic Bible. Having read the appendices for the first June, it makes sense. However, I do not understand the naming of it. Oh, okay, Grimdark, the Orange Catholic Bible, it's basically so it's a combination of the dominant Christian religions. And if you remember Frank's Irish Catholic, uh, Germanic Protestant background, so orange is the color associated with Protestantism. And I'm in the country to tell you that. <laughs> it's me give me some sexy sexiness says Stephen Campbell so ladies and gentlemen the person that's um, joined us there Stevie, Stephen Campbell is actually the person who plays the guitar on the end titles hi Stevie uh, it's good to see you my friend I hope you're keeping well um, so the orange Catholic Bible it's orange is Protestantism and then the Catholic is the other the other side of that so obviously all the all the Protestant churches are protesting against the authority of the Catholic Church. Um, so the, the Orange Catholic is is a combination of all your your Christian major churches, really, and um, and again, and again, that the whole thing is meant to be that it's the actual idea of the commission of ecumenical tra translators is to create a big melange hodgepodge of religions, filter out all the religions that won't agree with them. And, and wipe them out. <clears throat> it says, I think they wipe out disputant religions. And the whole point is that within that idea of, of the June universe, that every religion comes up with its own, we're the one correct religion. Um, it's it's about rather than disputing what they they all say that we're right, you're wrong. Um, it's more about trying to find what they all say together to give all the different religions a commonality. And it is that um, the one thing that all religions share within the June universe. That they come up with is that thou shalt not all religions share this tenet thou shalt not disfigure the soul so this this is this is and, and the cet and the orange catholic bible is meant to be a kind of um uniting factor for for humanity um and and really to promote the 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 provenancy of of humans um i think but the, that's where the orange catholic get, bible gets its name from there's no such book so you'll, you'll see it in my videos i i kind of made that book in photoshop um sean says europeans begin the age of sale and colonization for spices um opium brought down the old chinese empire the ussr kept itself on life support through oil exports and so on um Began the age of sale and colonization for spices, and drugs, etc. Yeah, Col colonization going way, way back. Sean, though, um, if you if you have a look at the Athenian colonies, uh, um, places like uh, Syracuse in Sicily. So the 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 purpose there, there's other purposes for colonization at the time, and I suppose it depends. But yes, highly linked to trade, and um, uh, but in particular in the ancient world, in the, more in the ancient world, resources, uh, particular resources. You know, so. Romans would go a long way up to Cornwall for ten, I think, for example. Um, you mentioned that the Exines flourished under Lido but stagnated after. Surely this was part of the golden path. Well, Lido said, "Do not fear the Exines. They can." Yeah, um, I mean, um, Dean. Uh, sorry, hello, Dean. Thank you very much. Um, you're absolutely right, Dean. That the whole fact the Exines are a, a lot of the problem for most people in the June universe. And again, this pattern that's repeated is they're they're all blissfully unaware of what how what they do or how what what technology they make actually affects their own evolution. And ev every group is guilty of this. They can't they don't have the foresight of that. Um but yes, absolutely, they're they're absolutely fine during the reign of Leto the Second. Everyone else is absolutely under his thumb. And uh, it's because of that. They're they're um, they're safe, they're they're safe, they're soft, and they're, they stagnate. And um, 
let's see. <laughs> Uh, Sean says oil exports. Thinking in terms of hydraulic gas baptism, it's kind of what Fogo conceded to. Yeah, I mean, I, that, I mean, sometimes hydraulic gas baptism is known as oriental gas baptism. I think, um, but yes, uh, oil. Um, it, it simply depends on what's your um, what's your currency of par in, in terms of that. So, Frank Herbert, for example, with um, uh, Chome. Chome, Chome, some writers would use allegory, and he, he actually says Chome's not an allegory for OPEC. Chome is OPEC. <coughs> Excuse me. So depending on what it is of the time, oil, gas, I mean, again, with winter coming, and the examples that I give of hydraulic despotism, um, I, I think was the one that just happened at the time when I when I started doing this, but it, it was Russia and the gas prompt. And the, the big gas pipelines. Um, again, the, the images, whenever we get to the um, the, the chapter on ecology, the, the chapter on ecology is hydrology, uh, sorry, ecology, um, hydraulic despotism and systemic thinking. So it really looks at those three things. Um, so the, the images that we've used in, in that are the stuff belonging to that company, etc. I think. Um, Stevie's going to like some of this stuff coming up. <laughs> Grim Dark Elven Lore Master does orange with Protestantism have to do with William of Orange and the Glorious Revolution. It is absolutely to do with William of Orange. It's the House of Orange, so um, which is a um, royal family from the Netherlands, and uh, which is extinct. Um, uh, William of Orange had no pro male progeny, um, I think. So uh, Dean McKenna's hey fellow Northern Ireland man there. Grim Dark Lord Master, yes. <laughs> so um, it is to do with that. And the current royal family in, Hall, in the Netherlands is the House of Orange Nassau. Um, so uh, again, with the, the Orange Catholic Bible thing, if you understand that it's about to do with disputant religions, then the whole Orange Protestant Catholic thing is the is exactly what pretty much the troubles in, in Northern Ireland is, is all about. So um, and. If you if you want to get Frank's ideas, I mean, um, one, the book that kind of went under a lot of June, or sorry, under Frank Herbert's uh, readers' radar, if you like, was that the same year that God Emperor came out, and we we all pretty much I think love that book. Um, his book on Ireland, if you like, for want of a better word, but um, uh, is the White Plague it came out the same year, and in terms of how Frank uses mythology and stuff. Um, it's a very interesting. It was you know there, there's um, Frank has a connection to to Ireland, um, and if, if you look at the female protagonists of his first three books, um, the Dragon in the Sea, June, and um, the Green Brain, which I find hard to say, uh, <laughs> um, they they all look the same. They're they're all the um, what you might call the archetypal Irish Colleen, if you if you see what I mean. Um, I was pointing out to someone before that Frank has a type. <laughs> <coughs> so there we go. So yes, the, 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 and, and to be honest with you, um, particularly people will talk about the Fremen and they'll go, oh, I can see a lot of the Arabian peoples, a lot of the North African peoples. The, there's, the Fremen are based on a whole bunch of people and people can't see the Irish connection at all. And so I'll give you the Irish connection. It's right in front of your face the whole time. By the way, there are two moons. <laughs> um uh in June and one is has the the the, the mouse shadow which you all know as Moa Deeb um the kangaroo mouse and the teacher of boys the other shadow on the moon is the hand the severed hand and you'll you'll see if you look at the David Lynch particularly the red hand being put in in your face um and the Bene Gesserit based on his Irish Catholic aunts weren't it? That's absolutely correct. Um, if if you get um, if you get a chance to read Brian Herbert's uh, book, a uh, biography of his father, Dreamer of June, that then there is in his early life um, pretty much a religious war going on over him, and it's these Irish Catholic aunts I think versus um, the paternal uncles and the German who are I think more. <coughs> I'm not sure if they're. I'm actually not too sure if they're Protestant. They may be slightly atheistic. Um, I would have to read the book again. Um, I, th I think it's in the third episode. If you look at episode three, it's a biography of um, Frank Herbert Dean. Excuse me. <coughs> My chest getting a bit coffee there. Um, so, yes, and the Bene Gesserit very much are, you know, they're an offshoot. The, 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 the name is loaded. Bene is good in, in Latin. And uh, the Jesuits are very much based on the, very much these Irish Catholic aunts and, also, the Jesuit order, 
um, uh, so yeah, the, there is a lot of, and particularly where does where's all the Irish stuff? A lot of it's to do with the museum Fremen, not the Fremen, uh, the museum Fremen, as I, as I've sort of talked about, and um, also the the biography of of um, Frank Herbert by his son is called Dreamer of June uh, by Brian Herbert. Um, I, I think it's I think it came out around two thousand three, perhaps. Um, possibly have a copy about it somewhere, but I don't, want, I don't want to run off the screen looking for things. <coughs> um, it's a very good read, by the way. I keep uh, people keep asking me about you know Brian Herbert and so on. Um, it's an excellent book about you know, it's it's a proper biography of Frank's life, and um, it's quite insightful. And um, there are so many different things in June. You know that it's it's kind of interesting to figure out where he got a lot of his ideas. Um, so there we go. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah. So it's it's a big the, the 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 Orange Catholic sort of the Orange Protestant Catholic thing. There's a big part of that in, in particular to do with the museum Fremen, which are the are what's happened to the Fremen after um, after three and a half thousand years of rule under the the, the God Emperor, and they basically are a museum people. And if if uh, my term for it is retarded atavism. And um, if you understand that, then they're, they're a group of people who, in their modern day society, look to the victories and battles of people who lived thousands of years ago, dress like them, act like them, pretend to be behave like them, and live in their glories, etc. But so they're a society that only looks backward, um, and that's what degrades and ultimately that the Fremen are doomed anyway. But if you know, it's. Um, uh, and have a look at God Emperor of June again. With, if, if, you, if you think about the Fremen that way, the God Emperor comments on their degradation quite a lot. Um, so any society that looks backward is, is pretty much screwed. Um, but, <laughs> but Irish society is particularly known for it. And um, uh, mythology has damaged Irish society incredibly over the years, um, and how it's used by. Um, uh, by both sides here, and, I, and I'm not talking about recently, but I mean, uh, recently is fine, yeah, but actually going back hundreds of years. Um, Fremont, or the analogous to the veteran troops, and I know Brian wrote something about Paul being greatly inspired by Lawrence of Arabia. Arab independence wasn't achieved despite Lawrence's efforts, says Grimdark. Thank you, Grimdark. Yes, they, they are based on the Bedouin, but they're, they're also based on the Sam people, of, uh, is, it, is it the Bush people of... Um, uh, Southern Africa, particularly, um, there's quite a bit of them in it. So the, the, you'll you'll get some of these kind of um, arguments over representation and cinema going on out of the Hollywood thing, uh, which are often quite venomous online. Um, but there's a lot of people who identify the Fremen as only kind of part of that North African culture, and they're not. They are they are actually themselves once again a melange of different peoples. And there, you know, there's an awful lot of, of the Bedouin in them. I'd say that's the dominant dominant um, group. And, and the Bedouin are very interesting. Um, so, yeah, partly inspired by Lawrence of Arabia, you know, Paul could be seen against so many different people that you can, I could, you know, list, list religious leaders, political leaders, and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. But Paul himself is a blend of so many different different heroes. From are definitely a syncretic culture, yeah. And uh, Zen Sunnism is incredible religion. 25 days, says Handy Barger. Hello, Handy. <coughs> yes, is that where we're at? 21, 22? Yeah, 20, getting there. We're getting there. Um, looking forward to the film. Oh, something quite bad's happened in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm going to tell you tonight, so I might not be going to see June in the cinema. Um, we're, we're, we're expecting another peak in COVID, and we've not been dealing with COVID very well. But our, our incredibly cretinous government has just announced that they're getting rid of all social distancing in theatres and cinemas. So um, I was only going to go to see June if I can, in a way, basically keep myself and my family safe. <coughs> and my, my family have various health issues that we, we're all vaccinated, but we don't want to get, um, it's, it's no um, absolute guarantee against COVID. We, we know a couple of people who are vaccinated are not doing well with it at all. Um, so they, they've actually changed the rules within the cinemas uh, in terms of social distancing and, and our cinemas are you're packed in like sardines. So simply put, um, if we had maintained our social distancing, those kind of things, um, 
out there in society, I would be absolutely going to see June on the 21st of, um, of uh, next month. And uh, the government have just, uh, again, our, 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 our branch, our health service is on the breaking point. And, um, you know, I, you'll hear a lot of stuff about the UK, etc., but we're often not factored into that. Um, and I have, have first hand knowledge of that because my, my wife works in that sector. It's um, so um, given the way things are going, I fear a circuit breaker on the time to see you. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's um, uh, it's it's sad, and it's 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 I, I genuinely want to go see this in the cinema, and I haven't been in the cinema. I can't um, probably in about a year and a half, two years maybe, and. Uh, I don't head out too much myself anyway, but um, I simply put, as long as people are behaving themselves out there and I can keep a distance, a reasonable distance from them, I, I'd rather, I want to sit, I'm happy to sit in a, in a theater that's got half it, half of the theater filled, but um, it, I suppose it depends on the cinemas. Um, but you, we've, we've got an awful lot of people with COVID here at the minute, it's a sizable chunk of our population. Pardon me. <coughs> so, yes. Uh, I hope to, I really hope that they, they, they wise up. Um, but we're, I think we're kind of expecting. Uh, they're talking that they're not going to produce another lockdown, but I think um, I think Christmas is going to be heading towards Christmas. I think we, we may be necessary. Um, excuse me, I need some fluids. I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. Give me a wee second. Anybody got any questions? Fire them all, fire them away. Um, Stevie, it's, if you're still there, it's good. To, good. To, thanks for joining us, mate. I hope everything's well with you and your family. By the way. Um, I'll have to give us a ring sometime, man, but I, uh, but I haven't caught up on ages. I'm caught in a very bad sleep pattern at the moment. Um, but it'll, it'll give us a bell, man. We'll have to catch up. Um, Stevie Campbell there, by the way, uh, that's all mine, is, is our guitar, was the guitar player from uh, Happy Shrapnel. And he, he's, a, 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 he's a shredder. If you listen to that guitar, I, I love his guitar playing. He's really good. Uh, I know we've had a lot of complaints about the music at the end of the show because it was too loud but that was all my fault you know but uh, he's, uh i don't know if he's still there or not but uh give us a ring if you are stevie not tonight but some sometime this week mate um <coughs> too bad uh june doesn't get a us release for next month says grimdark um yeah you're get you guys get it one day after us i think we're the 21st and i think you're the i think you're the 22nd in america is that correct and then i think you're the last group before poor australia gets it and uh uh, I think the second of December. So the whole world's getting it kind of in a, a day, a day, a day, a day here, a day there, a day there. It goes right around. And poor Australia has been a bit. Well, they're trying to be a bit. I'll, I'll not use them. They've been a bit harsh with their. Well, no, I think they're. Maybe they're being reasonable. I don't know. Every country's got its own situation with COVID. Stevie Campbell says I'm Russian. I just thought I thought it was just loud enough. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I've been ridiculously bad. Uh, I'm not deaf, but I have an unusual hearing problem to do with pressure. So uh, I can't tell if things are too loud or not at all. And um, one of the reasons why I get can people think I'm aggressive is because uh, apparently I, I, sh well, I seem to be shouting a lot. But um, to me, it's just all the same level. So absolutely, Stevie, it's never too loud, mate. I've, I've been pending the idea whether that we have a shrapnel of the second loudest band in the universe after disaster, disaster la <laughs> from uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide. 22nd for the domestic box office, says Grimdark. The good thing, Grimdark, I think, is that, well, I think HBO Max are going to go ahead and release it on the same, is it the same day or one day after, possibly? I don't don't really keep up with current affairs on, on this kind of, on the media kind of thing, you know? But, um, yeah, it's, um, I, su look, I, I, hope for, I suppose that's the point, isn't it? It's, a, it's not that the cinemas, I think, a lot of the cinemas have been open, but they've been pretty good at, keeping their, their safe distancing and their, you know, all of the, the COVID restrictions that they've meant to. And, um, you know, so I think people have been still been going, but the fact that I think we're, we're just assuming everybody's just going to pile out there and it's, it's a bit off-putting, to be honest. Um, but I, I think the fact that you can have the ability to watch it at home and pay for it if you want, I think that's a smart thing to do. Um, one of the other things I was going to say, by the way, is that this is what we're getting to see, and all of us who are waiting to see this is we're not getting to see a whole June movie. We're getting to see June Part One, and um, um, something that just occurred to me is that well, I'm I'm convinced they'll have Part Two, no bother, and, and that you wouldn't go ahead and, and an adventure like that without setting up some kind of 
you know, um, surety, if you like. Um, but if I, if you release part two of a film a year after you've released part one, I want to go see part one just before part two. So I, I certainly think there's a massive potential for re-release of June at the cinema. I don't know. Nobody's been talking about that. And I, I just thought it was interesting. If you've got a part two coming up, and there's so much to do with concerns about making money, surely you're going to release part one with that. And there, there are going to be people who are going to be absolutely nuts about June who are going to want to go see part one with part two and, and run the two of them together in the film and, and you know, bomb out for a quick, quick pee. <laughs> <coughs> I'm going to see Ridley Scott's last duel on the 15th of Grimdark. Yeah, I, I was thinking about doing a, 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 a practice run to the cinema because the, we're, we're getting David Lynch's June to the movies here in Korea. Um and uh, I'd considered actually using, going to see that myself. Didn't think the family would maybe go with me, but I thought I would use it as a try run to actually test the safety and you know all of the cinema and think about it. Um, yeah, Ridley Scott's last year. I think that looks quite interesting because I think it's a historical drama, isn't it? Uh, Grimdark. Um, Denny Villeneuve and Grimdark says Denny Villeneuve is typically a box office draw, but Blade Runner twenty forty nine was a box office bomb. Um, I can give you my own opinion on that, Grimdark. I might have mentioned it the other day. I think I, out of a given week, and I, I, I usually work slightly funny hours, but if I want to get to the cinema, I'll have to kind of make a, I'll have to make an effort to go and I'll go on that. It'll be that day that I go out of a given week. And um, pretty much from its arrival on a, a Thursday, the time that I got a day to go and see it, within a week's time, it was gone from the cinema. So um, if, uh, if Danny Villeneuve wants to know maybe why did his film not do too well at the cinema, I couldn't go see it because it left the cinema that fast. It was like, yeah, I'm so sorry, I really wanted to see it in the, in the movies. <coughs> Excuse me. How did they do it with the Lord of the Rings trilogy? I'm sure they had replays then too. Sean, I'm, I'm pretty certain I did the first two. Uh, when, the, when the second one came out, I, I managed to catch the first one again and then go see it. So and I saw all, all of them in the in the cinema. But yeah, it's it, it's it's why not? It's a it's an absolute no brainer, um, and it, it makes the story then fresh as well, if, particularly you know, if a year has passed or two. Um, I, I went to see all the Hobbits in the cinema. I took my son to see them, and they they appalled me. And for, for the first time in possibly my entire life, I fell asleep in the last one. <laughs> I think in the middle, I, I I just couldn't. It was the technology, it was the, the way they filmed it. It was very sore in my eyes, and uh, I did not enjoy it as a cinema experience at all. Uh, Dean, let's see, what's he got here? Do you, Dean says, do you think the Axe Lot Tanks for juxtaposition to the sexual domination of the honoured matri? The, the series took a strange sexual and gen, gender political turn. It absolutely did. Um, uh, the, series, the series took it, yeah. Uh, it absolutely did, uh, Dean. It's... Um, Hmm. Yes, I mean, you, you, I would agree with that. Um, it is absolute domination of, of an entire of your entire one gender of your species, uh, and it, it, it's sexual domination uh, in a reproductory manner. Um, and then, and then actually, that evolves in itself to be beyond that. And so, I think there's a bab saying about the the, the honoured matters just go for it because they're so disgusted at at, at, um, at what the what the the axe lot of tanks are. And it's the you think possibly the honoured matters wouldn't have done that if if the axe lot of tanks just produced golas. But it's the you know, um, and I'm sure they're not going to be liking the idea of axe lot of tanks anyway. But um, I, I would imagine that they would uh, use them themselves to produce artificial melange. But part of me thinks then it's, it's the actual fact that they're being used to produce a drug rather than other beings. That maybe uh, uh, Babs might be able to uh, pipe in on that one that, that, that brings about that, that absolute rage. But I think rage is part of their character as well. But yeah, it's, it's um, uh, and it, things are always responses. Um, and the, res it's, the response is always about how does that technology affect you or your your particular group in the June universe, all in Matra is included. Uh, Sean says, I don't care for how Peter Jackson stretched out the Hobbit story either. Uh, God, no. Um, it's not the Hobbit at all, is it? It's, 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 um, 
it is basically the Hobbit with pieces of this, that, and the other taken from the histories and bits and pieces. They tried to run a narrative and make it a. And I thought it was appalling, to be honest with you. And it, I'm glad it has Peter Jackson's name on it rather than Tolkien's, because um, it's not Tolkien's Hobbit at all. And I love the Hobbit as a, a, a book. It's it's a. I always think of the Hobbit as a kids' book, and then the adult, the adult sort of as the adult continuation, if you like, of the of the um, the Lord of the Rings. But um. It's a children's book that I think reads brilliantly as an adult, and I think it, it it's a it's a it didn't need that treatment at all. Um, I think one very long, one good three or two films maybe to split it in part two, but it, it certainly didn't need that. But I, I, again, I would have focused more on the Hobbit itself, the story there, and um, I wasn't too keen on the dwarves. Um, I got my doctorate from a dwarf in the Hobbit, by the way. If you want to know, <laughs> can you guess which one? For the people from <laughs> from Northern Ireland, they can tell you which which. Uh, so, uh, well, I, I got my congratulations and a from a Hobbit. Oh, sorry, not from a Hobbit. I apologise. From one of the dwarfs in the in the Hobbit. Uh, I'm sure you, you all know which one. <laughs> Peter Jackson can't be blamed for ever in the Hobbit. The studio executives only gave him six months of pre-production after Guillermo del, del Toro dropped out of directing. It's Nesbitt, of course. Yeah, that's right, James Nesbitt. Yes, indeed. Thank you, dude. <laughs> that's the dwarf. He's a bit tall for a dwarf. He laughed at me, actually, when I came up the stage because I'm, I'm quite a tall guy. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen what you look like if you're getting a PhD, but they dress you like something out of Chaucer. You look like an absolute idiot. <clears throat> of big red robes and a big floppy hat. And my ears <laughs> on this hat were sort of kind of Stuck down like that and flopping, <laughs> flopping as if I stop a down on the stage and a big, big um, cowboy boots saw me as well, just to make a lot of noise. But um, I, I think I, I think he nearly burst out laughing at me. I, I think I said to him, "You're a little tall for a dwarf." And shook his hand, took my degree, and buggered off basically. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's right. I think he wasn't he attached to that or something originally. Grand Dark says, um, but it was it was, it was just too much. And um, I think it was just an attempt to give the audience, I think the cinematic audience, another three films of the same of Lord of the Rings. But I think I think The Hobbit's very different in tone to Lord of the Rings. And um, The Lord of the Rings, I suppose The Hobbit's about an adventure, isn't it? The Lord of the Rings is fundamentally about death. Um, that's its major theme is death. <laughs> um, I think I haven't read the Lord of the Rings in a long, long time, and I don't own a copy anymore. I've I've got the BBC audio drama, but I I've, I would keep thinking if I were going to buy one, I just want. I used to have it when I was very young, uh, just one big volume, paperback, and I, I kind of want the same thing. If you know what I mean, I suppose it's a bit of a nostalgia, but there's so many fancy editions of these books these days. Tolkien enjoyed Asimov, interesting enough, and disliked Dune. Thank you for that, Grimdog. I didn't know that. Um, at the time, I was doing a PhD because uh, there was a chap doing one similar on on uh, Tolkien, and it was kind of there were only a few of us doing those kind of things. But I, I thought it was interesting that the the book that's considered the peak of of uh, high fantasy literature, and the one science fiction, the two of us were doing um, that kind of work at the same time. And his, I think, his was heavily based in, on environmentalism. I think. Um, Tolkien enjoyed Asimov, understand? Yeah, it's funny. We somebody was asking, maybe somebody was asking about the. Again, I'll just put this out there. Somebody might be there. I can't remember who it was asking me about the Starship Stormtroopers article. Uh, I think it was it was a good old rant by Michael Murcock um, about <laughs> about, and I, I think somebody pointed it to me because pointed me to it because it, it included Frank Herbert in there. Um, Master Merkel, was it yourself, Grimdark? Yeah, I had a good, I've got it on the computer, I had a good read at it. Uh, and I had read it before, a long, long, long time ago. Because it jolted, I just, it jolted a memory, and I have read it before, but I couldn't remember. Um, I have a big folder somewhere, with a whole bunch of articles and stuff like that. And uh, I just, <laughs> I enjoyed reading it, I suppose. But it's, a, a, you get a lot of this in the science fiction community, uh, and in the fantasy and horror community, if you know what I mean. They're, they're, they're quite well interlinked. And um, there's there's often the, I think we were talking about uh, is it Orson Scott Card's talk about there's a there's a, there's a quite infamous I think um, essay it's an essay or an article by Orson Scott Card it's about to do with June actually and, and um, uh, Osama bin Laden and um, 
And I always think it's, it's interesting about people's cultural prejudices. Um, I, it's one of those articles that's, that's kind of concerned concerned about, um, I suppose, uh, Islamic terrorists having read Dune. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, it was kind of a what if. The, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of dubious article. It's also full of that kind of stuff about what he doesn't like about other people's writing. And, and it, it is a common thing. Um, my, my own opinion on it was, I suppose, it was Murcock sort of setting out his stall of stuff. And, but there's a lot of sort of self kind of recriminations and blame uh, within it about New Wave in that article, I think. But um, it, it, it's very much an opinion piece. And I, I think he very much says so. But Mur Murcock's quite good at um, pushing certain things in a certain way. Orson Scott Clark's critics only focus on his apparent homophobia. Uh, I, I haven't read anything by Orson Scott Clark in a long time. Is he is he another one of these? Um, uh, is he another one of these authors that gets just you know there's a personality thing and everyone hates him for it? Is that that he's is, you know um, apparent apparent homophobia is a good. Is, I think people are either homophobic or they're not, and if they are homophobic, it's quite obvious. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Uh, I I couldn't comment on on his homophobia at all. I don't know anything about it. Um, I do know. Yeah. Well, I suppose. Um, I really just in terms of Orson Scott Card, I think it just there is a religious connection to him, and I, um, the, the books that I would know, same as yourselves, is the Anders Game books and so on. Um, I just thought I won't make it. Oh, hello, Ryan. How's it going? Uh, good to have you, sir. I don't know much about Mana, but I know he's some kind of Mormon fundamentalist. Uh, I could look into the matter, but it's, it's not the sort of thing that appears to I think somebody was talking about Asimov the other day. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of time and perspective, but I've, I've grown up reading Isaac Asimov. Um, I don't think he's the best writer in the world, but I, enjoy, I think he's a great ideas smith, if you know what I mean. And, and he's, he's good at articulating them. Um, and I've enjoyed a lot of his books. Um, there, there are aspects of his work. He's not, you know, but he is an ideas machine. If you know, some some science fiction. There's there's two types of science fiction really. If you want to separate out the kind of just the, I suppose the the very derivative stuff and just set piece kind of stuff. But pretty much there's the idea machine type thing is what I would call it. And then which which is is you'll find more in the short stories. They're, they're just it's an idea, but I'm creating a narrative to. What do you think? Hmm, that kind of thing. So characters often not fleshed out particularly well in these things. But um, the other side of that is where you get the writers who are much more subtle about their craft. Um, um, but yeah, see, Asimov's prose on a technical level is readable. It's Arthur C. Clarke's the same. And um, I'd separate Clarke and Asimov from Herbert and uh, Heinlein um, in terms of their writing because, the, the yeah, Clark and, and um, Clark and Asimov very much ideas guys. Their their prose isn't um, they're prosaic writers. That's the word for it. But Hubbard and uh, you know, saw his name pop up. Or sorry, not Hubbard. Sorry, Heinlein and Herbert. You know their 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 craft is to attempt to you know produce a a, a well realized story with good characterization and let let the story inform your ideas about what they're talking about not ram them down your throat but they tend so that's the difference between long science fiction it tends to be well written character driven and the ideas are in there but they're subtle in how they're presented if it's good and um but the short stories are really here's an idea and, and we'll, we'll frame it and make you hmm. um it, it's good because the short stories are great for that they're, they're they're very good philosophically or scientifically so yeah asimov um grimdark says on prose is on a as uh, on a technical level, as readable, at least, but you see, that's what I would call it prosaic writing. And you think, what's bad about that about being a prose writer? But that's bad. Um, Asimov turned out stories only taught by L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, ah, Ryan, I'll tell you this Asim Asimov, I think, is possibly the second most prolific writer in human history in terms of publications. So, um, you're talking about his story. <laughs> But uh, my understanding is that Asimov has a book in every single category of the Dewey Decimal System in your libraries, and he, he's written books on. I had a book on him, I think, about by uh, on invertebrates or something. Um, he's a, he's a church. There's there's another guy I think he's a Polish writer from the 19th century. I think he's got something like 600 publications. But Asimov is is in the hundreds and hundreds of publications. But it's it's um, it's he he wrote, you know he wrote Asimov's Guide to the Bible. Um, 
and he's an incredible self-publicist. You'll find all sorts of short story collections where he really often chats about it. I was considering putting together one of my own compilations when someone said I should do this with these people. Oh, okay. he's, he's a great self-promoter. But he, his reputation these days is, um, <coughs> wow, um, a, a, a very groupy of women, very condescending of women. And um, uh, yeah, and, and I think there's plenty of evidence for it. But I'd, I, I, I was blissfully unaware of it when I was reading his stuff when I was a young young person, you know. Um, Ryan says, vote for Heinlein. We, we, we did chat about some of Heinlein's books the other night, and I, found, I actually found a few more uh, the other day, but I've discovered my copy of Strange in a Strange Land it seems to be missing. Um, though I, I have books spread all around this house and in, in other houses, or my dad's house, because I have no room for them all here. Oh, but <laughs> Has anyone got any questions for me? Um, Ocean Scott Kerber will definitely go to buy. He's, he's on our A to Z of science fiction, by the way. So um, I think he is. Anyway, we certainly talked about him in that. Uh, we, we mentioned him a wee bit on um, our video, sort of from cyberpunk to modern to modern era. Um, so Ender's Game, yeah, the, there is a lot of. I understand there's a lot of Mormonism in that, and a, a fair number of science fiction writers put their religious ideas um, in there. So you'll you'll get that likes with um, fantastic books, you know. Um, Canticle for Leibowitz, you know, has, has, has uh, its authors, you know, Catholic. Um, there's a lot of that in there, and um, doesn't spoil anyone. You know, I think, he, you know, he, I think, he, I think Walter M. Miller committed junior committed suicide, um, which is really sad. Um, but uh, what else? There's, um, yeah, um, well, Gene Wolfe's book of the New Sun. You know, have, have a look at that for for you know religious. Um, Overlay and stuff like that. Um, linguistic. It's great fun for a uh, great book for words, um, and you'll you'll have to work with that book if you. Uh, but you can read it just the way it is, and just uh, assume that this is a modern language based on ancient language. Um, it's a very. Uh, if you haven't read the book of the new Sun, folks, um, uh, wow. You know, sorry, I shouldn't whistle with the microphone there, but uh, uh, they're excellent, absolutely brilliant. You know, really cracking books, and um, they they should be up there with. You know, the way people consider the Lord of the Rings, June, that kind of thing. The Book of the New Sun should definitely be there in that, in that company. Um, so there we go. But yeah, Asimov's stuff's great. And uh, I talk about, the, if we go back to my introduction, I talk about the first the first book that I sort of bought through a science fiction book club in school. And it was called Of Time and Stars. And it's probably here. Is it? I usually keep it handy somewhere. Um, but sorry, um, the the two stories in it that particularly ring brilliant for me. Hi, Aqua Baby, thanks for joining us. Good to see you. We're we're not about to go away just yet, so it's good to have you here, sir. Um, the two stories in that are Arthur C. Clarke stories and um, and he about the house. If if you understand the sensibilities of that story, I absolutely love it. It's clever. And it, it's, it doesn't need not doesn't really need the characters to be fleshed out. And it, it's an idea, and it's a comment on human society. And I think it's one of the funniest things I've ever read. And there's there's no obvious joke in it. It's you you get to the end and you realise what's happened. And I just put it down. And I was I was about eight or something when I read, and I understood it completely. Uh, and I just laughed my head off. It's kind of about keeping up with the Joneses. Um, it's a wonderful story. If you if you can ever, you'll find these stories in different compilations and so on. It also has the nine billion names of God, which is that what we call a. There's an entire trope within science fiction of stories. They're called shaggy God stories, um, and that's what you would call a shaggy God story. I think it's really good as well. But they're very short and to the point. And bang, you're done. You know. Let's see. Dean McKenna says, uh, coming to the end of the Hyperion Canto series, will you be covering it at some point? Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, also, what would you recommend I should read next? Looking for something similar. Well, uh, Dean, if you haven't read um, the Book of the New Sun, um, just with the first four books, go with that because it's a similar, similar size scope to um, to the Hyperion Cantos. Uh, oh, but I tell you what, look, if, I'll tell you what, if you're on a, if you're on a, um, goodness gracious, if you're just finishing up the Hyperion Cantos, uh, I would possibly go with a limp. Ilium and Olympus by Dan Simmons. Just keep that run going. And there are two books and you're done, by the way. Um, uh, the Demolished Man, Ryan the Scar, was uh, Alfred Bester. 
Um, I would, but um, if you, you might have read those, um, the Hyperion candles are excellent. Um, I suppose Ian, if Ian Banks' is culture, if you haven't read any of the culture, go there straight away. And um, Alistair Reynolds' Revelation Space Universe is pretty decent. Uh, if you're looking for a sort of um, Dan Simmons is really good with under 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 uh, textuality. So if you if you like that kind of thing, Hyperion Cantos has all that, that stuff to do with uh, Keats's poems, for example. Keats is like a messiah in in there. Um, Solaris is excellent. Got a copy of right behind me, and the film's really good too. I mean the the original film, um, and I. Uh, I don't think I, I I don't think I've seen all of the George Clooney one. I think I watched a bit of it and didn't didn't see the rest of it. Um, Stanley Swaflam, yeah, it's the same director as Stalker, isn't it? Tar Tarkovsky, isn't it? Andrei Tarkovsky, if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, do you think Keith Cobb? Hi, hi, Keith. Do you think Herbert's insistence on the distinction between Gola and clone is significant? Um, yeah, well, well, it's a loaded word, Gola, as well. First of all, I mean, it's uh, Keith. It's suggestive of ghoul, um, and it, it's yeah, very much living tissue and, and uh, dead cells, I think. Um, but uh, you know, a clone's a, co a clone's essentially a copy. It, 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 I think it very much is to do with um also that suggestion that the, the the memories that can come back that it's like an empty vessel that can be filled i suppose um and, and i think a book i think we mentioned this the other day keith a book that kind of deals with something like that is bear with me um is the boys from brazil oh i think stuff flying ah, here we go give me a wee second i'll just grab it for you um we've got that many things in here here we go there we go, which is um, Ira Levin. Uh, there we are, the boys from Brazil. I haven't got my, my, my sticker off. Don't you just love it when you get three books like this for a five? <laughs> um, so, yeah, the very famous film as well, and you kind of get a sense of, you know, what if you had a, the clones of Hitler, isn't it? Uh, uh, and Mangala. So it's, it's a very interesting, uh, similar kind of comment, I suppose. But if you the idea is if you had a bunch of clones of Hitler, none of them would be Hitler, I suppose. So, um, but the, the word is in particular Gola and Ghoul is, Ghoul is the association there. And um, yeah, returning of the dead and so on and so forth. You get to the point where you could almost argue that the, the hate Gola becomes maybe a revenant or something, um, if you understand that term. Uh, who would you say is the protagonist of the series? Aqua Baby, I keep, this is my own opinion, you, the reader, are the protagonist of the series. Um, and it's to do with the whole point is it's about you. I think Frank Herbert, particularly with the hero theme, Frank Herbert's tricking you the whole way and it's all about your response to this, this to Paul Atreides, how you look at him. And the fact is that you are, you're supposed to be caught up in the story of June, that he's your hero. You root for him. You, you've got obvious villainy. We don't like to see people, oh, his whole family's murdered. Oh, no, that, you know, you're, you're with him the whole way and that's the point. I think you're the protagonist. Um, in, in terms of, if you like, you know, theatre protagonist, antagonist, who's for the struggle, who's against the struggle. So in, in that sense, the Agon, Arit, and Aristia are a big, big part of the Greek world, by the way, but Agon is that kind of struggle, if you like. And um, in that sense, I suppose with the nature of the hero, everything's really to do with your interpretation of it and how you see it. So the whole, all of the action in June is long done. Um, you're, you're, you're getting snippets of, you've got an omniscient narrator and you're getting snippets of history to you. You're prescient of the action and it, it, you're aware, you, you have future knowledge and it's absolute knowledge. We talked about this. It's not foreshadowing. Uh, it's a different thing. It's foreknowledge and they're, they're different things. Um, so that I, I personally believe that as you read the book, this is my own opinion because because the main characters change and and um, you, the reader, are that protagonist and you're getting schooled in a deceptive way. And in particular, when we get to the God Emperor, I think the God Emperor is using the narrative of the God Emperor and again, more historical pieces and so on 
we're, we're still further ahead. We always have foreknowledge. Um, and it's more to do that. I think that's backed up by the mystery of the past. But um, I think that's what I firmly believe. Um, a lot of people would argue that Duncan Idaho is the main hero of the Dune series because there's a continual thread of Duncan's and he's this, this consistent character throughout. And it could well be that, that, that something like that was planned. But the, the whole point of the, and, and again, if you're all rooting for Duncan at the end, and we never got to find out what happened with me, obviously, um, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson answered a bunch of things for us, but we, we know that it cannot actually really possibly line up with whatever Frank was actually going to do because simply the difference in writers. Um, but the point is, Paul's a dangerous hero. We, yeah, we love Paul. He's great. Oh my God, he's a monster. What? Oh, here's Leto the second. Oh, he's great. Isn't he? Oh my God, he's a monster. So the whole point about these cyclical lessons. Paul's a warning, and you didn't pay attention. Look what he does. Along comes Leto. You do the same thing. You, the reader, root for this guy. You follow him. He's he's so unusual and charismatic. And, and these heroes were built to be absolutely appealing to the reader in every way possible. In, in a sense, to, they're, they're an amalgam of all the heroes almost that you've ever read. So the, the, the God Emperor, as I, I warned you once, look what you did. I'm going to show. And you thought that was bad the first time. Let's do it again. So my own, my own opinion about whether the, the Duncan Idaho goal at the last one would go was either he was going to be the, the typical hero that we we should expect in, in narratives like this, or else that he, he really, Frank was going to smack us all really hard once again. And I, I often, as I, I've said this, I'll, I'll, and I'll continue on with the questions here, but I've often said this battle at the end of the universe where mankind's, all that, so that's what the golden path's all about. What if Duncan was the, the, the hero that leads mankind into it? And he's even, and he destroys us all. And uh, what if he's the, what if he's the ultimate warning? So I think June's populated with um, warnings about individuals like that. But the protagonist, I, I, you know, from from my own analytical point of view, that's what I would I would suggest to people to think about. But otherwise, you can you can look at the book, sort of say that the first two books really focus on Paul, the, the second, then the third and the fourth books focus on Leto, and then we have the fifth and sixth books which are focusing on the Bene Gesserit. We have that Duncan and Miles Tegg really focus with the female characters as well, the Bene Gesserit. <coughs> so we talked about looking at the Dune series as either trilogies, but more actually as pairings, if you know what I mean. Um, that he had intended to wrap up that very, the seventh book was meant to be the end of all of that iteration. Frank had planned to wrap it up. Um, whether he would have or not, I don't know, because authors like to always churn out more books, don't they? But I think he dabbled in enough different things. I don't, I don't think he was not totally in, invested in the Dune universe. Um, Paul does have a reversal over the course of the trilogy, but for the series, Duncan adopts this role, in my opinion, says Aqua Baby. Yeah, it's, it's such a tricky thing when we talk about the main, the protagonists, the heroes of whatever term we want to use. It's loaded in terms of Dune because it is an education on, um, and it's, it's polemic, I think, as well. Um, but June, June is a subversive book, and it's subversive to you, the reader. But I think I think that's the way I would approach it. I I look at myself as the person viewing this and being commented to and being presented evidence, and then I get snapshots of action. And uh, as I said, the, the the good thing about the God Emperor is he keeps reiterating the lessons and uses his father to demonstrate the warnings that you were given and and applies them to himself. So, but that's that's the wonderful thing I love about the God Emperor is he goes, yeah, you look what you did with my father. My father was weak. My father was stupid. My father was this, that, the other. But look at me. And you did all of that with me too. And look at I. Look, you know, I can crush you in a second. I am. He's a god. <laughs> but there's there is something benevolent about the God Emperor. I think he's he's great fun. Um, but yes, that's the problem with the reversal as well, Aqua Baby. Um, we have that heroic nature. Then we have it. Oh my God, he's a monster. And then. Oh, he's doing it for good reasons. You see, that makes us reevaluate him after, oh, 60 million people. Well, it's, there's a good reason for it, I suppose. And then he, he turns away from it and goes, oh, you know, I can't kill millions of people anymore. I feel bad about it. <laughs> there, there's parts of it, if you, you play about a common sense to him, he's completely unsympathetic in that sense. But he is, you, we are sympathetic to Paul. And so it is, it's, it's a hero turn away return. 
and at what level of redemption does Paul have? And as I said, we you might think that, but then you go into God Ember of June, and what you're doing, what you're getting in God Ember of June is your hero from the, the first trilogy being crit criticized by his own son quite badly. And I think that, that it, it, if, again, we talk about how different ways we can read June if we read it as in a critique on the hero and, and keep that in our minds as we read through all six books. You'll you'll read it differently. You'll you'll pay attention to different things than if you were looking particularly at the ecological thread. You know, um, Ryan, so it comes to my mind is the Wheel of Time there with Goram. I haven't read the Wheel of Time. Um, I think we had a wee chat about that the other the other night. I was trying to decide. Somebody was trying to convince me to to read it. Might have been yourself, Ryan. Actually, I can't remember. Uh, but it looks so big. Uh, it comes to mind that the Wheel of Time shows Kevin J. Anderson style isn't that good. Um, but the books have that coupled structure. I agree with you. They they, they do. As I said, it's they're they're sold and presented as trilogies. Uh, if you think about this, the first great tr June trilogy, second great June trilogy, and the first all of all of the first June trilogy was all conceived together by Frank, um, according to him. Um, but then the, the rest of it, you know, we get them sort of ping about here, and then we get you know it's the, it's the early eighties. Um, there, there's a distinct change in style, not massively to the last two books, but they are paired, I think. Um, but the, also, if you think about what Palumbo says about the car the spiral patterns and the, these iterations of, of um, action and motif, is that you can look at the trilogies, but within, I think, that they overlap. So you could say that maybe there are two trilogies. But within that spiral of those two trilogies, we have overlapping pairs of two books. And I, I think I think that either the last book would have meant to have stood with the two Bani Jesuit books as a part of a trilogy there, in which case you could have looked at the Dune series as two trilogies with the separator of the God Emperor. Um, so that, again, there's different ways. That's that's the great thing about the Dune series, guys. We can look at it in so many ways. and. And all you're getting my opinions, you know, with a, with a bit of research. But if I approach it in a different manner, I can give you a different set of opinions and etc. And so can you know. And all of you know, as I said, everybody keeps putting these wee things out. They're all valid and interesting, you know. So it's um, it's not that can it's it's not. Do you agree with? Sometimes it's yeah, you can look at it that way. You can look at it this way, and that's what I think is really enjoyable about it. I don't know what you think. Um, I, can, I know that a bunch of you have read it multiple times, but a couple of people have said to me that they hadn't considered. I'm, you know, I'm going to read June simply focus on the ego lot because if you're going to reread it so many times, you can look at it different ways. You know, Kevin Jamison wrote a bunch of Star Wars expanded universe books that range from mediocre to bad. Says Grimdark Elven Lore Master. Um, that pair, that's true. Says Ryan Scott and the paired structure. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, and interesting, um, June is a response to a particular hero, the Van Vautian hero. Um, here we are. Uh, a Van, Alfred Eaton Van Vaught. So we've got the Voyage of the Space Bagel. Um, this is this is Slam. This particular, this is the book that's kind of, um, the, that's the basis of the archetype of this Van Vautian hero. Johnny Cross is the character in here. And it is, it's kind of like an Ubermensch. Um, and you could argue that the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe, I suppose, are, are superheroes are kind of this kind of Van Vautian hero. There's a you know a sort of disconnect from society, incredibly unusual powers, etc. And they're they're an evolutionary thing. Um, that's another one. I think is that the same universe? I think possibly. Uh, that's that. Sorry, that's Destination Universe A Van Vaught. So my understanding is that Kevin J. Anderson now writes. With this estate, if you see what I mean, that writes writes new books, um, in regards to slam, which is the archetype of the Van Vollian hero. And if you understand that, that's that's Paul Atreides is, is as much a revolt against that type of hero. Frank Herbert's Paul Atreides is a revolt against the hero that's that's kind of emerges out of 40s science fiction. This is the kind of the pro progenitor of it, and it's very interesting that Frank Herbert and um, it talks a lot about um, science fiction as a literature that's in the gutter. Um, part of, the, part of <laughs> if you see what I mean, and that that he he wrote June with a deliberate intent to not create a piece of pulp fiction, but instead to um, 
to actually try and lift science fiction out of the gutter. And it was it was important. He tried to write a real piece of literature, and, and he succeeded. Uh, but it's a response to that pulp fiction. And I, I, the only thing I think when people talk about Brian Herbert and Frank Kevin J. Anderson in relation to the, the, the Dune property is that Dune is a literary response against the pulp science fiction world and a, and a particular type of hero. And you now find his son uh, writing the new pulp, selling out, you know, basically making, churning out um the new June books, mass production almost, and, and um, I'm doing it with an author who's also doing the same thing with the with the slam with that hero that that uh, that is it's a response to. So Kevin J. Anderson's also the person that's peddling, I suppose, the modern version of the Van Vautian hero. And but at the same time, he's writing the June books, and that that's paradoxical. And sure, not you know we can all wear different hats, but the, I think it's interesting. I don't know if you've considered that. Um, let's see, Timothy Zahn for, I would go. I think we're talking about the Star Wars books, Expanded Universe, is that there? Um, I don't really don't read fiction like that. I, I, I would have done when I was younger, but it was a, a very much different thing. I think we talked about three, three Han Solo books that came out, uh, goodness, possibly in the 70s or early 80s, and there was also Splendor of the Mind's Eye, but that, that's about as far as I've delved into the Star Wars universe, though I, I didn't have a Wookiee cookie, was it a Wookiee cookbook when I was a kid or something like that? <laughs> to make Wookiee cookies. Uh, something like this happens in Star Wars, although it tries to stick to trilogies. Thrawn trilogy was really good. Uh, it's really good. Um, actually, I'll tell you what, I did used to read some of that stuff because I think it was made into comic books and a friend of mine would have bought a good bunch of those and I seem to recall that the Star Wars universe pinched one of 2000 ADs really good artists to draw a lot of them and i think it was cam kennedy if i'm not mistaken uh van vaught is less known as he deserves i i'm, I'm not being critical of a van vaught's books by the way i think the science fiction is good it's it's the it's the it's the and it's interesting that it has names attached to it but yeah there's the null a books that it's, it's pretty decent science fiction don't let me absolutely not a critique by the way of these books um this stuff's pretty decent uh, I don't buy, I tend not to buy rubbish books. So uh, the whole point of this June thing is it's a critique against the, the hero that, that emerged. The hero in this book is kind of almost original, I suppose. But the whole point is it's the, the whole churn of heroes that emerged out after. So Slam, Johnny Cross is kind of almost the archetype for that hero. But it's it's uh, not saying they're bad books. I, I like A.E. Van Vaught and um, give him a check out. Yeah, I... You, you tend to see his stuff in still in science fiction bookshops. So, um, but I, the stuff that we would maybe get over here in Northern Ireland, for example, you would always get the big four. But I used to tend to spot more. You, you used to tend to find quirkier, odd science fiction writers. But you know, again, we didn't have a lot of, uh, particularly in the seventies and eighties. You know, uh, we didn't have that, that that sort of selection here. It's a bit of a different world. We different foodstuffs and. Uh, no band would ever play here, for example, that kind of thing, you know. Um, Dean McKenna says, um, but yeah, but I've, I, I would say A. Van Vogt's pretty well known. Um, I, he's one of those old writers. Like, um, there's A. Bertram Chandler, for example, who does books like, uh, is it the John Grimes? John Grimes books, is it? Grimes books, uh, Road to the Rim and the Hard Way Up, and they're like um, Hornbrower in space, and they're really good. Um, Trump came up last night. Months ago, I said he was an inverted quiz at Sadarak. <clears throat> an inverted, uh, okay. Uh, let's have a think about this. I said he was an inverted quiz at Sadarak, profoundly untalented, yet fell arse backwards into a culture condition to accept them as Messiah. Uh, maybe that's an interesting point, Dean. Um, an inverted quiz at Sadarak. Quiz at Sadarak is a shortening of a way. And in a sense, a quiz outside represents a cultural bridge that, that's in many myths. So, um, no, he's not. Um, what he is, is, well, I think I made it, I, I, I talked about him a couple of times tonight. But, um, no, he's, he's, he's just, uh, uh, I'll not really go into it too much, but no, um, you'd have to have a profound shift in culture before and after Trump for him to be that. And maybe we maybe we will maybe we won't but i don't i don't think anything's changed in american politics and i, I think we said the other night that if, if that something like june's not a warning against people like trump um 
into your culture condition to accept him as a messiah that's interesting Dean, because that that's pretty much the point of june is that almost all cultures are conditioned that way and and if you want to break it down into sim simplicity it's it's great to blame other people for your problems and isn't it wonderful if somebody come down and sort them all out for you um as i, I think it's pointed out a messiah is just somebody covered in oil <laughs> as an anointed one but if, if you know uh, <laughs> oh this this could be possibly but no it wouldn't be blasphemous would it at all uh what's the what's the um steve martin poem is it uh oh pointy birds oh pointy pointy anoint my head anointy anointy so messiahs is an anointed one um it's, it's an interesting term there are an awful lot of messiahs tons of them in the ancient world uh, <laughs> um but yes people it, it's part of it, it's the same it's to do with whenever we get to the hero chapter we go into this in some detail it's to do with um a cultural malaise uh a, a real bad shift in your culture it is it's it's you, you see it i mean you see it all over the world at the minute it's easy to blame anyone for your problems take, take your scapegoat and pick them and then you know oh here's trump and, and to be honest with you if, if anyone promises you something that sounds too good to be true it probably is so I, I consider that there's a world full of people with common sense that have no problem looking at trump and seeing exactly what he is um he's a snake oil salesman if, if you want a profound I don't know if we can say a profound term, but a, an appropriate term. Um, and he's just an aggressive narcissist, that's all. He's just a bully, nothing else. And uh, if you understand that money is power, and there you go. Money is at the head of your little tripod. But no, that's all he is. He's just a man. And um, unfortunately, if you understand how religions are created, we, we'll, we'll talk about this in the hero chapter. Mm. Uh, the, 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 I suppose there's a lot of mankind's own self and divinity and so on. Um, excuse me, but um, well, the hero worship is a major part of the ancient world, and in particular, whenever you see a lot of the stuff that's in, um, I talk about iconotropy and things like that. And for example, uh, how, how Lord, um, whenever I'm talking about things like how Lord Raglan didn't understand how you, how you look at how you research and evidence the ancient world, for example, and the myths exist not just in poems and. I think there's a lot of cultural artifacts in that episode that are the real thing, by the way. So if you if you actually have a look at what they are, you'll you'll see what I mean. But um, uh, yeah, it, it's it's part of us to seek the divine in ourselves, I think, um, rather than admit to any kind of other form of mortality. But it, it's a universal thing. We we all kind of want to be saved from our our lives in some way or whatever drudgery or, or, or terror or death or, or problem that, that, that society throws at us and whenever we do have problems rather than get picking ourselves up and sorting them out um, we just tend to go ah there's so many people there coming over here taking our jobs it's this that, that the other. and your your most democratic politics are um most democratic societies are uh, their political setup is adverse adversarial which doesn't actually serve anybody uh, and if you listen to the logic behind why we have adversarial democracy, it's, it's um, uh, we should have cooperative democracy, preferably something like isonomia. So the idea of what democracy is is, is, a, is a misnomer, really. It's not quite what the Greeks had. Uh, it's kind of more of a modern word. But what, technically, when you vote, actually, you're handing your power away. If, if you vote for a representative democracy, you're giving away your power. Uh, and you're trusting someone else to do something with it. Uh, Greek democracy is isonomia. It means equal law. You were your government. You didn't get to hand your bit of paper over to someone. You had to go and do your day and contribute to your own society, and you got your pebbles to go. So it literally, uh, well, they excluded women and foreigners and <laughs> men under a certain age and stuff. But if it, if it had been inclusive, it would have probably been what the closest thing you would talk to is as an ideal democracy. If you're going to try and build a utopian society, isonomia, isonomic, um, democracy is how you do, how you would do it, but no, America is bipartisan now, isn't it? There's your clue. So us and them, um, it's as simple as that. This country's us. Uh, well, for me, it's it's all them, which I, I think is great. But outside of this house, it's them and them. <laughs> it's us and them. It's all uh, Catholic, Catholics, us Protestant, us them. them. Uh, society divides like this, and and uh, it's either politics or religion that usually puts these. Um, spurious divisions into people's minds, you know. Excuse me, Lee Sagan. <coughs> Goodness, I went off on one there. I'm a bit of a political animal, if, if in case you haven't figured. Um, 
I got Herbert Rook Jr. as a serious and Agobe Gunner, but as the close round one. Oh, so I've got to back up a wee bit here, but Tom. So uh, Tom came up like, okay, maybe it's much easier to write as Van Vaught than Herbert. Ah, oh, in terms of the Kevin J. Anderson, I, yeah, I, different animals. Again, I'd say Van Vaught's a pulp writer. Um, but the, again, good, 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 good stories don't have to be, you know, yeah. You don't have to have every story beginning with like you know sing news of arms and the man or anything like that it's just once upon a time is good enough if you see what i mean it, 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 it depends on if you want to claim literary chops or not but a good story is a good story and a good writer can write a um, a good story there's so many ways to write well i think i mean you'll often hear me i just tell you all oh, this book's fantastic uh, the, the writing's very good, the characterization's good. I mean, I'm being quite vague. Each each one of these writers, I mean, has their own particular talent. It's what we were talking about earlier, about different writers slagging each other off. I think it's it's a bit of jealousy. If, if that Orson Scott Card article about um, June um, and, and the concern about it being read by, you know, an Islamist or something like that. I, I just think it's funny that you see if you put it into somebody, put it into another, another cultural set of hands and put it in another place and go, oh my God, this guy from Northern Ireland has read June. Holy shit, what's he going to do? Uh, because, you know, I suppose uh, how, for example, British society looks at Islamic terrorism today is how Irish people have been looked at in uh, the Islamic um, community in, in Britain is looked at the way the Irish community used to be looked at. Um, and people forget about that as, about it as now, I suppose, because you, you'll not hear the word terrorism involved with Northern Ireland on, on TV. We have a different set of words for it now. We call it um, paramilitary style, like, you know, like Gangnam style. It's paramilitary style. You know, it's, it's appalling euphemism. Um, this country is full of euphemisms, I suppose, as well. So no lang language, and language is often used to direct people to hate others. If you look at look at Hitler operating, um, Hitler, Hitler's, Hitler's, what's Hitler's really good ability is that he can whip up a crowd at speech. He understands the use of voice, and the use of voice in June in particular is, is it works on a number of levels as well. We have the idea of, of general semantics, but in particular, how leaders can use voice is incredibly important to Paul Atreides because it's it's Hitler's key skill. If you ever if you, if you ever watch um I thought Saruman played by Christopher Lee wasn't done that well in Lord of the Rings because if you listen to the guy who plays him in the audio tapes and the and that is really by the way the way he does Saruman's voice and he ranges from but the, the anger but then the control the Ah, that we were friends once, and, and the tone of this guy, and how, it's all about voice. So voice is a lot to do with that, I think. So I'm, I'm, I do. My head does wander around a few wee things here, but that, that's the nature of June, isn't it? Powanda says Dave McCann. <laughs> Ryan the Scar, the unrest boiling, waiting for him to be gone. Uh, oh goodness, the Trump thing, and uh, I, su I suppose the fear that he was going to get, and he could still get reelected. Um, but it's a propaganda machine. Very much. Uh, that, if you, Trump controls his, uh, tries to control his image, but it's uh, he doesn't really care. Uh, that's the interesting thing. He's, uh, he, to, to, God, to Trump, God is Trump. Um, Frank Herbert was a registered Republican, but he was an anti-Nixon and against the Vietnam War. That's right, Grim Dark. Uh, I think, and um, I think it's correct. Uh, sorry, my, my memory's a wee bit. Thin. The, the thing I think we were reading about within the Michael Burcott's article about Starship um, stormtroopers. Was that as much, he wasn't slagging Frank Herbert off too much, but it was the I think it was something to do with him getting signees from very, I think it was something to do with Judith Merrill getting signees for the anti Vietnam War statement at the time. I think Frank Herbert was one of those signees, but I think I think it was something to do with whatever magazine that was. It might have been New Words that they ended up publishing a list of science fiction authors, a bunch of who were word for the war and a bunch of who weren't. <coughs> um, Vietnam's cultural imperialism. Um, yeah, war in general is uh, <laughs> quite appalling. Um, America has been in that position for a while now since World War Two. You'll hear America talk about it, where the where the world's policemen and the duly does and ethics and all of this stuff. No, um, honestly, it's a narrative that not America talks to itself because nobody else believes it. Um, we don't look to you for leadership. We don't look to you for moral guidance. 
and you've got far too many guns and we don't see you as too civilized. America looks a lot like the Roman Empire and, and has actually quite a lot of the, sorry, I'm not, I'm not being too rude to American, American viewers, has the trappings of the American Empire, or sorry, the Roman Empire. Um, and if you understand how what happened to the Roman Republic for it to become an empire, then Trump nearly just pulled that off. And that's kind of uh, we're, uh, what you guys are talking about, Trump. I, I was telling you, we've seen people like Trump before. I don't know if any of you know this, but the Roman army, uh, sorry, the Roman Empire was actually sold by a guy. <laughs> and it, um, if you want to look into that, have, if, if you ever look at the, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon, you'll, you'll uh, just look it up and you'll, you'll you don't, it's, it's, a, it's an, I don't know. Big big thing, but just look at that and you'll you'll find out all about it. It's very funny. Um, uh, do I mean like Kaiser Caesar Crassus Pompey? And say, yeah, the triumvirates. Yes, first and second triumvirates. But though it's it's um, first first triumvirate absolutely, and then things go away. But it, we have a triumvirate in Britain at the minute, and it's a hidden triumvirate. I would I would point to it and say that we have one. And I don't know if and nobody else will tell you this, but it's my own opinion. And if you understand how a triumvirate works, uh, folks, so we have Crassus, Pompey, Caesar, essentially think about the Roman Empire. Pompey's at home. He deals with the Senate, controls things there. Caesar's army and, and religion, he's out there dealing with the things. That, and Crassus really just is kind of, it's more a political shooting money. So and the second triumvirate, I think, is it Lepidus, is it? In the second one with um, uh, is it Augustus and uh, Mark Antony, I think, is the second triumvirate. I might, oh, my memory. Um, I'm a very heavy in the Greek side of the classics and, and enjoy the Romans, but not don't like them too much. Um, crossing the Rubicon is my favourite metaphor. Yeah, point of no return there. So the, the, the point where the where, um, Roman army must disband before it enters the city's limits. So crossing the Rubicon is that line where if you cross that with arms, you're, you're showing military intent to the city. Lepidus is. <laughs> there you go, Mark Antony and Octavian. It's Octavian, sorry. Octavian is Augustus. My apologies. There you go. Thank you. My memory's not that bad, Grimdark. Octavian is the name of Augustus for yeah. Um, the first row. So basically, the Julius Julius Caesar is um, after the first triumvirate falls apart, he becomes a dictator, and um, a dictator isn't what you think it is. He's given these powers for a year. And at the end of the year, you know, okay, I'll run room for you, okay. And then the people give him the powers again, two years, three years. Fourth year, they give it to him for life. And Rome doesn't like kings. Rome's a republic. But at that point, uh, he basically is made dictator for life. And Julius Kaiser is not, Julius Kaiser is not a Roman emperor, but he is in all but name. And uh, basically, his, his money upon his death, his will goes to um, Octavian, who's his nephew. Uh, but he makes him his adopted son. And, uh, Octavian keeps that name for a couple of years and then becomes Augustus. So if, in case you're ever confused, Octavian Caesar or Octavian and Augustus are the same person. <laughs> I think he kept the name Octavian for the first four years. I might be wrong, completely wrong. Um, so uh, where are we? Um, so yeah, Lepidus within that other triumvirate. Mark Anthony, Mark Anthony is the, the military might, Octavian is the political power and the money. And but Lepidus is money and he's he's a he's a weak shoe in. And so the, you understand that they operate separately within three spheres of Roman society, in a sense. And they're they're they work together, but they don't always seem to. Um so we have Boris Johnson's part of a triumvirate, I think. And if you want to and, and you not the, the other two people in it aren't necessarily well, one of them's a conservative, but the other one isn't, I think. Um, but I would say he works a triumvirate with, um, oh goodness, what's that, Nigel Farage and uh, uh, the guy that, I can't remember his name, the, the guy that um, <coughs> looks a bit like Harry Potter in the British Parliament and, and cultivates a kind of look deliberately. Um, what's his name? Jacob Rees-Mogg. I think those three are a triumvirate. And, and you'd have to actually have a look at them politically and go, what the hell is he talking about there? And then you might want to think about it, about, about what's happened in Britain, Brexit and so on. <clears throat> but uh, a lot of our leaders tend to be not elected anymore. They're, they're, they're just deals done within parties, I'd say, almost every other prime minister. We've uh, current leader in Northern Ireland is unelected. Um, 
and is looking to create another oligarchic coup. He's looking to shut our part, uh, our government down because he can't get what he wants. And uh, we've actually had a couple of years without government. And uh, I suppose the Lyra, Lyra McKee murder was a response, of, uh, an ultimate consequence of that, you know. Um, so the decline, let's see. <coughs> but yeah, that, that particular period of Roman history is fascinating and, and extremely bloody and violent. And um, yeah, it's, it's easy enough to take power, I suppose. But, well, the other saying is that power is never taken, it's given. Um, to claim and follow the Roman Empire directly inspired the Foundation series. Yeah, you'll find all sorts in there. Uh, it's a great book. I've, I've only got one volume of it. There's only one volume that I needed to use. Uh, it's, it's incredibly well annotated and um, makes makes quite a good read, I think. It's, it's in that sense of um, thoroughness that you might go. There, you'll often find a direct link between something like Herodotus' histories and Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War um, to Gibbon's decline and fall. But it, it, it's almost like a, a combination of those two styles, an attempt to be as thorough as hell, but also to be a, quite a well-written book. Uh, you know, it's good. It's good. You know, uh, there's different ways to write. Well, as I said, you know, uh, became emperor at last. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. So <laughs> uh, Julius Caesar, if you don't know, was uh, stabbed. 23 times on the floor of the Senate on the Ides of March, which is the Ides of the middle days of the March, on the 15th of March. Uh, does anybody want to know what Julius Caesar's last words were? <laughs> uh, apparently, I think as according to Cato, he wasn't able to speak, by the way, I think, because he had a knife in the, through the lungs. So uh, my understanding is Julius Caesar didn't have any last words, apart from Earth. Uh, Romans invented the genocide. Ryan, they certainly did not. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, I can go super degenerate. I, if, I, if you can see my other bookshelf, there's a rather good book on Greek orgies. Um, no, the, <laughs> the Greek world is much more... I think the Romans are just a bit more open about it, but the, the Greeks are full-on, you know, ancient Greeks, pretty saucy place. Uh, <laughs> uh, et tu brute, et tu brute, et tu brute, and it wasn't et tu brute. I used to say a joke about that. Would you, my my, my um, Julius Caesar joke is um, <laughs> it, my understanding is that the, in that sense, brute is a double meaning in Latin. That's on you, my son, something something similar like that. Uh, uh, but my joke is it's always, you know, uh, and then Caesar goes, uh, et tu brute, at that point. Brutus goes, it's Brutus. My name's Brutus. How many times do I have to tell you? It's Brutus, not Brute. But there you go. Sorry, that's just my, my wee Shakespeare Julius Caesar joke. I think it's funny. Ah, do mind some Brutus. Ah. ah, oh, is that German translation? There you go. That's interesting. Your books are too out of focus for me to read the titles and judge you from them. Oh, I wouldn't judge a book, a book from its cover, and you shouldn't judge me either. <laughs> Keith, you'll not be able to. You, you're only seeing a very small selection of books. <coughs> Sorry, I don't, uh, uh, we had to move the room around a wee bit. Um, but it's just a sort of weird selection of science fiction and stuff. Um, there's all sorts there. But uh, half the books in this house are science fiction. The other half are pretty much, you know, classical Roman and Greek books and stuff like that. And a lot of, you know, kind of Vikings, all these sagas and epics and things. Sorry about that. Um, you know what, maybe I'll tell you what, hang on a second. I think I'm, I'll bring the... Uh, da, 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 da. I don't know if that will help you a wee bit. There we go. They might settle in a wee bit, if you maybe we can see a few, but we're at a bit of an angle there. <laughs> the, uh, uh, uh. The brothers Gracchi assassinated really started all the political violence in Rome. Grimdark. Very good. Grimdark. I didn't know you'd heard of the Gracchi. Uh, Tiberius Gracchi was assassinated. How Scipio conspiracy between Scipio and Africanus and so on. Uh, Grimdark, if you're studying that period of um, Roman history, that I think the, the main textbook is called From the Gracchi to the Nero. Yeah, it's to do with um, grain reforms and stuff like that. Uh, Scipio Africanus, he's a geezer. Uh, going back to. Um, yeah, uh, do 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 Well, they um, what are they called? The Punic Wars. Uh, time to point out that the Romans got running water and plumbing. Um, thank you again. You'll find no. <laughs> Go back. Europe got the plague. Well, one, one of the things, Ryan, that uh, people were talking about recently, uh, I find it quite stupid on a lot of the news is whenever COVID hit, and the, the people were talking, oh, this has never happened before. This is all new. 
not to me, plenty of this stuff in history. And um, if you actually look at um, the, the classical world, it's great because it's so well documented and recorded. That if you look at the plague of Athens, uh, which is very interesting. And in terms of modern archaeology, by the way, what the nature of what what kind of plague was it? Um, the, the good money now suggests it was Ebola. Uh, and the reason why we can look suggest that, I think, is we have such detailed talks about the different waves of the plague of Athens and how it came into the city. Um, and actually, over years, people have had different theories about this. And I think the main one was based on archaeological work done on dental rec dental work that suggested maybe it was typhus. Um, Dad, yeah, Grimdog was a Latin miner, so he knew some of this stuff. Well, oh, I, excellent. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. That, but then we've actually, because of the recent Ebola outbreaks in Africa, we, we're we're getting research. We get descriptions, and then we suddenly go, "Oh, hang on, something we've just learned today matches up with descriptions of the plague of Athens." And uh, that's very, uh, it's a very interesting thing as well, because um, if if you look at that period of Athens, it's the end of the Athenian Empire, pretty much, and that's the period where you get plays like Lysistrata, and um, as much as you have uh, what's his face? Uh, sorry, that's terrible thing. What's his face? Got him. Pericles's funeral oration. Um, which is the, that great speech that, for example, you know, the Gettysburg Address is based on that speech. Um, there's a link between that funeral oration and the Gettysburg Address and the, and the speech delivered by um, the I Have a Dream speech, as it's known by, by uh, Martin Luther King. There's actually a direct reference from one speech to the other to the other. But uh, Pericles of Athens died in that play, I think. Um, so there we go, time to get the Romans out. <laughs> uh, the, the Romans are very interesting. I've been to Rome and... Um, I had a great time going around, and I have ancient maps of Rome and uh, Athens. I've never been to Greece. I can't wait to go. Um, I'm sort of those things where I land in one of these places, and I know so much about them. I just can't wait to tear up, but I have yet to get to Greece, unfortunately. I must have, he's got nothing but respect for Greece. I Cleese, Pericles. Yeah, I think these are the big heavy hitters in, in Athenian history, and uh, particularly in, you know, formation of democracy. Uh, oh, Thucydides, yeah. Oh well, yeah. Th uh, Pericles is uh, presented as a, you know um, one of the, the world's first great political sort of leader, you know, in that sense of a, of a, a democratic one. You know, um, uh, when you think about it, they got Heron of Alexandria. The, the, uh, Alexandria. Uh, there's so much in this part of the world. Um, who, Dracon's an interesting guy to look at. A lot. We, we use the word. I hear the word draconic has been put around a lot these days. And uh, if you look at Dracon's homicide law and stuff like that, it's quite interesting. This close to underwriting the real world. Who says they maybe didn't? This is the thing, there's a lot of lost things, I think, isn't there? Look look at the analog computer from 200 BC, lost up until around 1900. So we went through 2,100 years of human development not knowing that a Greek had made a computer. You know, who knows what was lost? And that, um, and that, that the good thing is, like, you know, Archaeology is going through, technology is helping archaeology a lot. And the, the more we sort of look into this thing, I think it's quite interesting. One of the things about Ireland, I'll tell you, is um, archaeologically, um, Christianity is an invading force to Ireland, um, if you think of it that way. And there, there are various types of, you know, uh, pagan religion sites here. And almost all the early Christian churches are built on top of these pagan sites. Um, you know, they'd either destroy them, the anti kithra mechanism indeed, uh, Ryan, they'd either destroy them, but often they're, they're, they're built on top. Um, our, our, our old drummer from Happy Shrapnel that you hear on the thing, he lives out next to one of these ancient churches, and uh, it is built on top. You'll find old ancient Celtic symbols around the area rather than there's actually pagan symbols. And it's for good reason indeed. Um, but it's, it's it pretty much, it stops any kind of archaeology movement because the, we want to protect the... The Christian narrative in Ireland and the whole St. Patrick thing. We don't want to talk about anything before that, really. And we won't excavate these old ruins of churches. We won't dig them up and dig under them because they're often built on uh, particular, you know, really interesting sites that would have much more archaeological value because uh, they're you're not running short of churches in this country, if you see what I mean. But um, there's some some fantastic archaeological um, places. You've got like many stone hinges and things in Northern Ireland. Um, O'Sheen's Graves a good one. If you like your myths, my favourite myth in Ireland, about Ireland is O'Sheen's grave, and it's um, 
uh, uh, do I play D and D? Dean, I used to play Dungeons and Dragons heavily in my youth. I'm a, I'm a first edition player. Still got some of my first edition books, um, but I haven't played Dungeons and Dragons with with people for probably about ten years. Um, and my last time play, well, the last time I gave it a go, and it's you know those sort of people who like to, uh, you know, just go right, you're dead. <laughs> what do you? I got about ten minutes into the game. Um, it's, I, yeah, playing with a psychopath, I think. So it totally put me off D&D, &D and I ended up actually selling all my books immediately after that. Um, give, I'll give a bunch of them to somebody. But I, I, I bought a few, actually, and I'm trying to con consider playing a game or two with my wife now and then or something. You know how influential uh, June was on Warhammer 40k? It's all on <laughs> Yeah? Oh. <coughs> well, I suppose. I'm, I'm a bit of a misanthrope, Dean. So, um, uh, yeah, I would only have ever played that with a very small group of people in my youth. And I, I played through all the original kind of D&D campaigns and stuff. And I uh, love it. I love, love, love that kind of thing. I used to play Paranoia and <coughs> the original Warhammer 40k and Traveller and things like that. Um, it's all on there. You know how influential June was on Warhammer 40k? Absolutely. Um, still is, isn't it? It's the Emperor of a, you know, the Empire of a Thousand Worlds. The Space Marines are kind of the Saudi car, aren't they? And um, I love that dwarfs talking Scots nowadays. No, dwarfs talking Scots nowadays. What's that mean? Sorry. Oh, dwarfs. Yeah, did I miss something? Dwarfs. Oh, I suppose the idea that the dwarfs are kind of quite Scottish. Is that what you mean? Right? <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. Um, I've always, yeah, it's been around for a good while. It's not heresy. Uh, yeah, the, the religious aspect. I haven't got into the Warhammer. I used to play those battle games as well. And again, you, I'll be talking about the very first editions of these things, you know, Warhammer 40k and uh, Warhammer Battle when they first sort of came out. I used to play um, a long time ago quite a lot of sorts of war, war games and uh, car wars and things like that. But uh, even games like um, Harpoon and uh, ooh, uh, stuff like that. So, no, I, I would have been a war gamer, um, if you like. <laughs> Sisters of the Battle are like the Bene Gesserit. Aha! I've got, yeah, I've got a Warhammer. I've, I have to say, I've, I've, I've continued on with the Warhammer 40k. Uh, I've got a couple of the games, uh, which are quite good. I quite enjoy them. Um, the, bat, the you know, I quite like strategy games and so on. So um, that's about it. But I occasionally see these things. Um, but I, I kind of, again, got, um, I think when Games Workshop went all super big and stuff, uh, I suppose it was their Citadel miniatures and stuff like that. Um, and I suppose one of the things when I got out of the, the, the whole role play thing is whenever in this company they made miniatures that were made of lead, illegal. Because uh, some kids sucked on them and ended up in hospital, I think. And I, I, that was kind of a, a killer. I really enjoyed painting the, the, the wee miniatures, I have to say. Uh, Leave the Sex Basis of the God Emperor of Mankind. Yeah, um, I, looking back at it, I remember having those books. I used to borrow these rule books and look at them. You know, if you're if you're under your role play games, I used to design my own systems and stuff, draw maps and things. Um, I think it's a big part of if, if you're under role play games, D and D and stuff. It's a big part of for a lot of people of uh, science fiction and stuff like that. Um, again, guys, if you're in America, you know D and D is kind of second nature here. There, there's different things here in this country that certain certain times would probably got you burned or something. Um, believe it or not, I mean, I, I actually remember as a kid, I mean, I like rock music and the local, you know, the local Protestants are burning uh, records by Black Sabbath and stuff. They're actually burning them at the local leisure centre. Um, unfortunately, I remember my mum was actually really scared at the time. <coughs> In the early 80s, I think a bunch of these agents had got together to, they were doing the whole Dungeons and Dragons as the work of the devil and satanic and all this nonsense. I got together and had a wee burning as well. And at the time, this is Northern Ireland, you have to understand. Um, uh, my mum was actually quite worried because hardly anybody played these games here. And I'm talking in the late 70s, early 80s, and um, me and my friends kept it quiet. This is something, I'm not joking. Um, until maybe into my later teens, and then just stopped caring. Actually, there's a point where you just stop caring about people in Northern Ireland and just get on with your life. Um, <laughs> so you know it's funny that um that, that probably didn't happen you know in england or any, anywhere else but here maybe um so there was a satanic association with just about everything sometimes back then and uh oh, it's just the local people being silly and uh you smell heresy <laughs> keith i'll tell you what that's a bit about what we're not here so having long hair was dangerous when i was growing up yeah uh, doing all sorts of things dangerous here just if you're not part of the establishment you know 
and uh, Northern Ireland's not very progressive yet. I think you know. I try to be hopeful about it. Morg Borg is the RPG with the highest shock value. Morg Borg, don't know that one. Used to quite like Merp. Merp was a good one. Middle Earth role play. But one of my, I think one of my all-time favorite games. I like, yeah, I like Call of Cthulhu as well. And um, there's a big satanic panic here in the states in the 80s. People want the present child molestation should be based on course testimony from children. Is that always oh, is that to do? There was a film that came out in the early eighties, Keith. That, that I think it was like a Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, you know, my son's been turned one of those shock or, or you know scare films that was probably um, probably paid for by some kind of Christian production group or something. But you, you do get these things. You get um, you know mothers against goodness or people against goodness and normalcy. I always like that one, the pagans from the uh, from the Dragnet film. But it's uh, yeah, everybody's. I think you got something like that. Then you you have a I don't know. It's isn't it a, a Christian women's group in America or something that wasn't there a bit of a backlash about Lucifer uh, when it came on the TV? And I think they're the same people that kind of had a bit of a backlash against uh, Neil Gaiman way back when. You know, I think all it does is promote the heck out of Lucifer, uh, which we all think is a great show in this house. We love it. It's funny as hell. Uh, Did these targeted as well? Yeah, it's sad. People just, you know, um, Dungeons and Dragons is a game. If you if you look at the, we talk a lot about mythology here, folks. Is a game that if you've got a monster manual or you look at the rules or it introduces you to so much, you know, and a lot of those, if you look at the monsters, they're they're from mythologies from all over the world. And if you're if you're a little kid playing on like if you've got a dictionary of mythology, go, oh, and a freight well, it's from Arabian mythology. Oh, wow, look, you know, it, 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 it's um, there's something about Dungeons and Dragons that's very multicultural because it uses a uh, a lot of mythology for its for its its monsters and you know its its world building. Because of the Eldritch Magic Companion, yeah, I suppose anything to do with magic and uh, that sort of thing. Eldritch is a great word, Ryan. I love the word Eldritch. It's a cracker. <laughs> Has anyone here? We've been rambling away. It's just crossed into the midnight hour, and it's Monday, so I'm sure maybe a few of you guys are getting tired of me. But I'll I'll go for a couple more minutes if you like. But if you've got any questions, and uh, fire away, and uh, I'll do my best to answer. I think women on the altar to be sacrificed. Well, a lot of a lot of the old Dungeons and Dragons books have got you know a lot of the a lot of fantasy role play and fantasy books in general have a lot of quite saucy artwork. And so does science fiction. And and fairness, you know, it's it's a big part of I suppose the magazine era and stuff like that. Um, I always remember there's an episode. I can't remember. I think there used to be a cartoon in Dragon magazine. Uh, like a three-panel comic strip, uh, and it was a sort of Dungeons and Dragons cartoon. Yamara was it maybe called? And there was a there was a great, great picture of Yamara sitting in the bar with a with a flag and a veil, and she's wearing that kind of scale mail bikini armor that you would associate with Red Sonia, and she's got two arrows sticking out of each breast and one out of her her. Um, Loin clothy bit or whatever, and the joke is that she says, Fat, fortunately, I was wearing my armor, you <laughs> know. And um, it's, the, it's that kind of thing, had us, I suppose, quite a bit of a, a backlash. Fantasy artwork was in the vein of Frank Frazetta, for yeah, I love Frank Frazetta. And it, you know, um, if you're scared of a bit of nudity, I think that's that's your own problem. Um, the, the, there is a lot of that kind of thing, and those kind of you know, in the fantasy science fiction art worlds, it's fine, it's um. You know, it, it does t- tend to be a wee bit silly when you see people wearing furry bikinis in, in what looks like an Arctic region. But, <laughs> you know, that seems to be, maybe they're not bothered by cold, you know. Um, I don't know, but there's all sorts of, and, and I think that art applies equally to the men, I suppose. So, um, Science fiction, fantasy, horror, and even adventure story type art from, from a long time, it, it, it does have that bit of a level of unity. I was saying the other night, actually, you know, if you understand the, the Arabian Nights, is, is, as much as we think of uh, Aladdin, and, you know, this kind of thing, it, the, the book can be quite filthy uh, in places, you know. Larry Elmore is great too. I've watched, yeah, I, I I would have grown up and I would have read all the Dragonlance books and stuff and um, played the Dragonlance modules. So you can kind of you can kind of date me by the, the kind of games that I played, World of Greyhawk and uh, um, Dragonlance, but, but particularly I would like the you know the Queen of Spiders and Temple of Elemental Evil and Scourge of the Slave Lords. That's kind of my 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 golden period of, of advanced Dungeons and Dragons, if you like. But Larry Elmore and um, you know who who else were there? There's Clive Clive Caldwell and stuff like that. Um, 
Yeah, they're they're great artists, absolutely great artists. I, I you know, there there's a different kind of art around these days, I suppose. There's a program Ryan on on I think Netflix that that looks at the art of Dungeons and Dragons throughout all the years. I think, and I, I watched it not too long ago. It's exactly about these kind of guys. Um, Frank Frazetta is fantastic, and I think he's a big part of the look of particularly fantasy sword and sand on a lot of science fiction. You can, if you look at his artwork, Frank Frazetta's artwork for Battlestar Galactica, it's absolutely excellent. Uh, and I, I love Frank Frazetta's artwork. I have to say, I, I'm a massive fan. One of my favorite drawings just is that that double spread, you know, that cover for a, is it Thuvia made of Mars by him. Um, so he would he would have done a lot of the bar soon. Stuff, but Frank Frazetta would be your go-to guy for a long time, I think, in, in the, the artistic world. But there we go. And uh, who else have we got? Robert E. Howard would have been proud of Frazetta's card. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's the artist that you'd associate with with Robert E. Howard. Um, I'm, I'm, I was reading, I've been reading, I put stopped for a wee while, but I got it halfway through the, the complete original Robert E. Howard stories very recently, and I, I'm enjoying them enormously. I, I have not read a lot of them. Um, again, the sort of thing about the, the old carousel books, shelves that you get in your libraries, you'd often get the odd one here or there, but and you would read them, but you'd never be able to start at the beginning, I think, as a Conan the Sumerian. Um, so no, I've, I've read loads of the, the Robert E. Howard Conan books, but not in any particular order over the years. And um, Ah, Solomon Cain, yes, indeed. And so you, you know, that's your triumvirate, really, with Robert E. Howard, isn't it? It's, it's Solomon Cain, Conan, and uh, has read Sonia his as well, I think. Um, but yeah, Solomon Cain's quite good. And uh, the film recently was very good. I think it was Pete Postlethwaite, um, is a, a fellow Sumerian. He's, uh, he graduated from the same university as I did. He's, I think, sadly passed away just after that. But it was James Purifoy, wasn't it? Um, as uh, Wag Cull. Um, James Purifoy, as. Um, Solomon Kane, and uh, I, he's a re he's a really good actor. We we've had him over here for a long time doing kind of below the radar stuff and being really good. And you're always wondering when he's going to get a career. Now I think he's jumped over to America and he's doing very very well. But he's he's in a lot of good things. Uh, I thought I thought he was excellent in, in Altered Carbon, the first one there. Um, yeah, um, Conan's excellent. I think. Um, Solomon Cain, I, I think I've only read a couple again. Call of Atlantis. <coughs> Another Crom storyline. Ah, well, well, Crom's quite interesting. Crom Croc, if you have a look. Um, you've got a few, quite a lot of Irish place names with the word Crom in it, believe it or not. Um, and um, a lot of these old names are quite indicative of uh, the level of that uh, worship of that cult in, in ancient Ireland, I think. Call of Atlantis was hard as other favorite, famous characters. Yeah. I mean, I also used to look at a lot of them. You see, we would get occasional stuff from America and um, occasional stuff from Europe. And interestingly, we used to kind of get heavy metal, the American version. And very rarely, I knew somebody who used to get the old metal hula. Um, but yeah, you're, so you kind of got drums and drabs of that kind of science fiction here. I'm going to call it a night. Good night. Good night, Dean. Uh, yeah. Grim, yeah, good night, folks. Listen, I'll tell you what it is. It's uh, 10 past midnight uh, here uh, coming up to. So I think it's a good time for me to call it a night. We're, we're, do, we're doing a good couple of hours, I think, on these almost every night. And um, we're, we're continuing the theme of evolution within within people. So tomorrow night's episode is the one that really looks at, at the two sort of really, the two groups of, I know we didn't get to talk much about Talaxu Axlotl tanks for artificial melange at all, Keith. I, mean, I did a wee bit of a run on melange earlier. Um, <laughs> an hour later here, but you know, guys, get your questions together for me. If we can happily run on any of these topics anytime, so I suppose I'm I'm happy to talk about anything. But uh, uh, really, just it's it's whatever each video is fresh each evening. We can have a chat about that. But we're here for all things June, and uh, as I said, like, the whole point about this place is uh, whenever we burn out of June, and I don't think that's possible. I think you could talk for years about it. Then uh, the idea is to build a wee sort of um all things science fiction here and uh, i think it is indeed fun grimdark um, it, it's a, it's a bit sad that the conversation is a wee bit one one way from my point of view and i'm, I'm not a person that like I'm, I'm very happy to provide my opinions but i can't get this quite the same opinions back from you but i hope it's uh, um i hope i'm not coming across as too opinionated and i'm not trying to put down any ideas 
um, I, I think that the main thing, no matter what, is you can you can ask my opinion, and I'll give you an informed opinion about it. But there's so much to do, you know, and and I really do want to stress this. You can interpret it in a different way than me, and it entirely depends on the way you look at it. And there's so much in it that you can miss. Um, I'm still learning stuff from it. You know, it's um, and, and it, there's a lot of there's a lot of misnomers and a lot of uh, wee bits of bad wisdom and things in it. And there's it's it's interesting to point out its flaws, I suppose. Um, but they're not big ones, you know. And uh, it, it is very enjoyable. I'm I'm kind of enjoying doing this at the minute, and uh, it's it's good fun. So, guys, if you want, if you want, you know, um, uh, think about a few questions for the next time and so on. And uh, uh, but yeah, well, all all of this stuff. That's the thing, um, Keith. All of this stuff's connected, and no matter kind of what you talk about, the the ability to I can I can move around with a lot of threads so sometimes it may be helpful if you guys can bring me back but they're all interconnected and even even we're on x lot tanks leads to artificial melange talks about hydraulic despotism we're on the gas where do you see how i mean that's the thing about june and it's the reason why i decided to pick it it's complex it's complex as hell uh and it's not it's not complicated though it's complex and i, th I think that's a lot of people tell you know, June's a complicated book. I don't think so. I think you can follow the story, no bother. It's complex. And if you really want to peer in depth into it, you just need to pay attention in certain ways. But there's so much. We were talking about Peter de Vries, you know, just the other night, just to leave you this stuff. A lot of the characters' names are loaded. A lot of, um, you know, we're talking about Gola and Ghoul. But that's that's to do, I was just checking my memory. We we're talking about Gregor Mendel and, and genetics. And that, um, de Vries is, a, a particularly Ghoul's, have a look at Hugo de Vries, you know. Um, Herbert's loaded, loaded the entire Dune series with uh, with all sorts of allegory, direct points to real world people, real world scientists, um, theories and, and stuff like that. Tansley is another one, you know. So, um, I'll pull, yeah, it's, it's easy to get off topic, isn't it? But um, I think we're still staying within the general sphere of things. And uh, we'll have the tomorrow's at tonight's. Sorry, tonight's will be tonight's episode. At this point, um, we'll be on the Sardaukar and the Fremen. And um, as I said, they're the two groups that most represent this idea of uh, you know survival of the fittest, um, which is not a kind of a, it's it's a kind of a misnomer, I suppose. But um, we we actually again they actually kind of represent a I suppose a Darwinian view and a Lamarckian view, and that's part of why we've set up a lot of this. Um, to do with Samuel Butler and the ongoing argument that, that exists, existed in Victorian society over Darwinian evolution and um, Lamarckian evolution. I don't know if you know this, actually, but for a brief while, actually, Lamarckian, Lamarckian evolution when it actually came back in favour for a little bit of a while. And its name, it's kind of changed its name a wee bit to try and rebrand itself, and soft inheritance and things like this. But it, it eventually, it, it, I think it, maybe some people still look at it that way, but it, I think it fell out of favour. So it, it does reflect that, and, the, and you've got these two sides of uh, survival of the fittest, and the Sardaukar and the Fremen are kind of also two shades, two sides of a coin. So um, uh, thank you very much for joining me, guys. It's it's uh, been an absolute pleasure, and uh, I hope you all have a good evening, day, morning, wherever you're at, when we're all around the world. And we'll we'll be back live after the uh, every show for until the the film comes out. Is it 24 days to go? So good night, folks. Take care. All the very best. Thank you for joining me. Do, do, do. There we go.